Welcome to Uncaged, the show that celebrates thought leadership from today's top business leaders. The program provides a voice to amazing executives from around the globe who are shaping the world of business today and mapping the path to the commerce of tomorrow. Today, we are speaking with Bryson Rayom. Hey, Bryson, how are you? Good. How are you doing, Matt? I am very, very well. Uh, you know, you are working in an industry that is top of mind for everybody I know. Uh, <laughs> Bryson Rayom is the founder and CEO of Rayom Richardson. Uh, Rayom Richardson is a Los Angeles-based general contractor with over 20 years of experience revitalizing cityscapes throughout California and, and maybe the world, I guess, <laughs> at this point. And, uh, and so we'll talk about the, the type of work that Rayom Richardson is doing. We'll talk about the broader real estate, the construction marketplace today. But before we get there, Bryson, let's talk about you. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your career. Yeah, um, like you mentioned, Bryce Rayom, I'm uh, 41, live in Pasadena, California. Um, married, two great kids, uh, I have a boy who's nine, girl who's six. And yeah, I've started uh, a commercial construction company, gosh, coming up almost 21 years ago, and uh, started in the tenant improvement space in the downtown core. My father was a, a general contractor. Uh, he focused mainly in the residential space, kitchen, bathrooms, residential remodels. So um, I credit him for getting me getting me into the space and kind of teaching me some of the, the tricks and trades over the years. Um, and early on in my career, you know, I was very fortunate. Um, there's a, a couple key catalysts throughout my career that I think kind of brought me from being down in LA and working and, and doing smaller tent improvements to where we are today with, uh, you know, 50 employees and doing some amazing iconic projects uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, one of them was uh, early in my career, I met a guy named Goodwin Ga. Uh, who owned a lot of buildings in the in the Los Angeles area. He was from Hong Kong, Singapore area. So, uh, you know, he took a liking to me, saw some potential when I was younger and essentially said, hey, you know, I've got a lot of work. Would you like to do all this work? And so he kind of opened the floodgates and said, here you go. And uh, was really a catalyst for uh, growth in the early years. And um, it was special in the sense that we had him behind us. So we were allowed to make mistakes and move quickly, uh, which is something unique for anyone trying to grow a business to kind of have that security of, hey, we've got a lot of work coming, uh, we're allowed to make these mistakes. So that was huge. Um, number two was my business partner, Evan Richardson. He came on about two or three years into, into the business and uh, which has just been instrumental over the last 20 years in terms of strategy, growth and, and things like that. Uh, third, I would say I was lucky enough to join um, an organization called YPO, which is the Young Presidents Organization. Mm -hmm. Absolutely transformational for me in terms of you know, personal, professional, family across the board. It's just a, a peer uh, CEO group. But um, for, for uh, somebody young coming up in the industry, having that group uh, of people that have been through it, that have done it, that have grown and sold businesses was uh, very impactful for me. And a, a lot of my strategy came from, from uh, talking to those people and working with them. And I'd say lastly was, um, this is fairly recent, maybe four, four years old now, is we started operating under a system called EOS, which is the entrepreneurial operating system. Absolutely transformational. Um, you know, one of those things where you're like, why didn't somebody give this to me 15 years ago? Uh, yeah, so we've been operating under that. It's been fantastic and has really well, been I mean, I mean, us. all of those things, uh, YPO is a spectacular organization. Mm -hmm. um, EOS is a fascinating operating structure for mm -hmm. sure. Um, but before we get into some of those things, I'd love to just kind of get a little bit of a, a deeper dive, go a little bit deeper into Rayom Richardson. So yep. you guys really have a different take on the market. Seems like you focus on iconic buildings, kind of bringing these things back and, and turning them into uh, really modern and progressive projects. So tell us a little bit about how you guys approach things. Yeah. And um, yeah, I mentioned Goodwin. And so that was uh, a function of in the early stages of what, what he was doing, what he was interested in. So when, when we started work, he was at the forefront of uh, the adaptive reuse program in Los Angeles. So we started on some of the initial big projects in downtown LA, um, the Douglas building lofts, uh, the Rowan building lofts, El Dorado. Um, so we were fortunate enough to make a name early on in that space. Um, and so it wasn't by design, it was just all of a sudden we had all this great experience in that space. 
And, uh, you know, there was a very steep learning curve, uh, historic adaptive reuse, you know, historic adaptive reuse that is hospitality, a very difficult um, project type. Um, and so, you know, over the years, as we started moving on to different project types, you know, we really learned how difficult it was. And we're like, wow, all these other projects are very easy yeah. <laughs> compared to what we're building over here. But again, we had made a name for ourselves and we, we realized that we did do it well. Um, so, you know, what we've done is we've, we've put a really great team of people together that understand that product type. And it is a very, very specific product type. You know, if you're talking about doing ground up multifamily, does not apply. The teams, the methodologies, the, the pre-construction process, the, all the way down to who you're working with, um, mm -hmm. architecture teams, MEP teams, and things like that. Um, so we really focused on surrounding ourselves with all the way from the very beginning of, hey, we want to work with the right architecture teams that understand these projects. Um, and they have created teams around them in terms of mechanical, electrical, plumbing engineers, all the way down to our subcontractor base. Again, you're not going to, um, a plumbing subcontractor that understands a, you know, a $40 million debt for reuse is not the same plumbing contractor that understands a ground up uh, $50 million multifamily product in, in downtown LA. So yeah. we've been lucky enough to um, have the time to put together those teams and surround ourselves with uh, the right vendors, the right clients, so we can kind of excel in that space. And again, we spent a lot of time educating our clients on, on what, it, what it means to take an old 1912 12 story building and actually bring it back to life, you know, yeah. gut it, structural retrofit, bringing all the systems back, all the power and things like that. Um, and that's, that's been fun. You know, some people understand it and some people don't take our advice and do it another way. And uh, we always check in on them. Too well, you know, the end product is always so marvelous when you mm -hmm. kind of put these things together. And I just wanted to jump back and talk a little bit about uh, something that you mentioned in those kind of four pillars that have shaped uh, what you are working on in your career. Uh, so you have implemented EOS. Tell me how that has kind of reignited the business and restructured it a bit. Yeah, um, you know, it was one of those things where in the in before EOS, it was really uh, Evan, who I mentioned, my business partner, and we had a great team around us, but there was no true executive team. It was really Evan and I running every aspect of the business, and we had a great division of responsibility, and it worked for us, but it was very much a two steps forward, one step back process for years, um, trying out new things, trying out new systems, uh, and I look back over the years of a million different processes we came up with and, and templates and forms and operating systems. And again, I, I just kind of laugh about it because there was this system out there that worked so well. And through IPO, um, I was lucky enough to go to a conference where they had a presentation on EOS. They had some EOS implementers there. And so right away, I, I had some people that highly recommended it and we jumped in you know, feet first um, and hired an implementer. And it was unique for us because uh, historically, you know, EOS is, is brought to teams that already have an executive team, a six to seven person team. Mm -hmm. So for Evan and I, it was, it was something special. And, and our implementer kind of told us this. He said, you guys are in a really unique spot because you have an amazing firm, but you actually don't have an executive team. So mm -hmm. you guys can take all these tools and really build it from the ground up and bring these people in and layer them in as you need them. Um, and we move quickly. I think within a 16 month period, we had created an entire executive team, brought on a new CFO, a uh, new VP of pre-construction. We had hired a COO, um, a VP of project development. Uh, we had brought on an HR manager. So you can imagine, you know, operating without all those people to then operate. Yeah, no, I mean, it's an interesting moment, I think, for companies that reach uh, a certain level of scale where you have to rethink kind of upper middle management and how those levels will function, but not only function, but also start to develop the next generation, the next yeah. generation, the next generation. And it's something that a lot of groups struggle with, for sure. I can see that as a major hiccup moment in, in many of the entrepreneurial businesses that, yeah. that I've worked with over the years. It sounds like you guys have done an amazing job in that regard. Yeah, we've been very lucky and, and um, I am a huge fan. I mean, I have, I have, I have 20 books that I, I keep in my office and when people come in, subcontractors and things like that, and, and we have these discussions and I, I can hear their struggles that I've been through. I'm like, take this book, read it. 
And I've had several subcontractors take it and it has transformed their businesses. You know, they've, they've taken it, they've implemented it. And I thank you so much. This is, this has really helped me. Cause like I said, I, you know, had somebody given this to me 15 years ago, I think I'd be sitting in a, in a much different business that, than I am now. Yeah. Um, but we love it. We love the structure. We love the vision. Uh, it's helped us with our culture, our values, everything across the board. And just creating that clarity um, was, was a big part of it, you know, of what we're doing. So Bryson, I was mentioning this before. I don't think I can go out and have a conversation at any type of event without the topic of real estate and construction coming up. It's been something that has been first and foremost on a lot of people's minds and how it's changed dramatically over the last couple of years. But tell us a little bit about what you're seeing in the, the broader market today. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, we saw, obviously, during the pandemic, there was a, a slowdown. But, you know, as, in this industry, we were an essential business. So we were able to kind of keep moving forward. Um, we did see, you know, at the end of last year, there was uh, an absolute slowdown in the work. And I think what that was, was a lot of the projects that were in the queue kind of got put on pause. Mm -hmm. um, all the projects that were already kind of half-baked continue to roll through. So you saw those projects come through. And then the projects that never moved forward, you saw those kind of dry up. So the end of last year, there was a little bit of a lull. And then as we kind of truly came out of the pandemic, the floodgates opened um, this year in terms of it is, and I, you're, I think you're seeing it in Miami as well, it is just absolute chaos. Everyone had been holding on to this, these funds, this money. Now they needed to deploy that capital. So everyone is just going as fast as they possibly can engaging projects, trying to move as quickly as they can. Um, and they're doing that, in my opinion, to try and kind of beat the market because everyone knows where we're going with rates. Everybody knows where we're going with inflation. So everyone is kind of going as fast as they can trying to beat that. And um, it's, it's creating a little bit of chaos in the market. Mm -hmm. um, and it's something where, again, we're spending a lot of time right now educating our clients on, hey, if you're starting a project right now, these are some of these key things that you need to be aware of specifically around supply chain issues, uh, material issues and things like that. Um, and it's, there's something new coming up every day. You know, yeah. we had an issue the other day where um, we had a vendor say, hey, they're running out of paint. I said, what are oh. you mean they're running out of paint? He's like, well, this chemical system that they have over here that actually comes from overseas. So that we're gonna see a, a situation where we could run out of this specific type of paint. Um, you know, there's situations where we're seeing entire buildings being redesigned uh, you know, specifically because you can't get uh, the right type of lumber for the building or you can't get the, uh, the roof material or something like huh. that. Um, and also the bigger players in the market, we see them um, early on, they started buying up a lot of this material in bulk because they, yeah. they saw it coming. That's good for them, not good for the rest <laughs> of the players in the market because now you have this one firm that owns half the roofing material in Los Angeles and yeah. everyone else is scurrying trying to figure out where they're going to get their roofing material from. Yeah. Um, so it's really, yeah, that's not a good situation. Yeah. Like, yeah, 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 exactly. Suddenly the roofing material prices goes <laughs> yeah, through the roof. Yep. Go through the roof. Yeah. No pun intended. So we really are telling our clients right now, um, you know, pre-construction is key. If you're going to be, if you're going to be doing a pro uh, project, you absolutely have to bring on your GC early and work with them through a pre-construction phase because it's not just about pricing out a project and putting the schedule together anymore. There's all these other elements to the project um, that were caused by the pand pandemic and, and the material and, the, and inflation that you need to really start digging into and understand. Um, you know, we have a, a $30 million project downtown. We're, we're pretty much buttoned up and we have no appliances, no appliances, you know, oh, and nice. they've been pushing it out and they were ordered on time. They ordered last year, but we get a notice every day. It's another month. It's another month and they're stuck in the port and that they can't get through. Um, and there's just nothing we can do about it. So you have yeah. you know, 300 units that are ready to go, but they have no appliances in them. So you're seeing stuff like that happen. Um, and it's devastating for the client, obviously, but there is ways to manage around it and set expectations. So as long as everyone goes in, we say eyes wide open in terms of what you're getting into, um, you, you can work through it. I think it's the people that do a hard bid and just start without having those thoughtful conversations before they start that end up in a lot of trouble. Uh, yeah, no, I can see that. Well, I mean, clearly the pandemic has had an impact in the market and I can see the dynamics here where you have um, 
perhaps a mix of shortage of supply. Mm -hmm. Some things probably in real short supply, others maybe not so much and keep shifting and changing. And then obviously the broader financial yep. uh, challenges with yep. higher rates looming, but how that will impact things, nobody fully knows. As yeah. far as I can see being here in Miami, it's not stopping anything. So yeah. <laughs> it's not stopping anything. Yeah, everything is, everything's moving forward. I mean, and then you get into um, just labor, you know, yeah. staffing rates, and that's a, a much bigger conversation of, of what's happening right now in, in our industry um, nationwide. We are short, so short staffed with, with quality labor um, tradesmen across the board. Um, it's very, very difficult right now. And that's dangerous. It's dangerous for the consumer. It's dangerous for the people that are building because people are transitioning. You know, you're seeing people that have no experience in the industry that are just getting thrown on the job sites. You know, it's like, hey, we need a warm body out here working because mm -hmm. we've got too much work to manage. Um, and the rates are going through the roof, uh, what people mm -hmm. are getting paid in the industry. So there's a lot of kind of piece, pieces that, that come into it. Um, and so people need to really understand the whole ecosystem of the construction world to, to be successful right now. Yeah, well, I mean, I guess, you know, in a dynamic and a, a growing market, there's always going to be these kind of challenges, but it seems like it's heading in the right direction. And I just would be curious, you know, we're now in the middle of 2022. and it's been a year where I guess we perhaps thought we were going to be sprinting out of the pandemic mm -hmm. onto a brave new world. Uh, perhaps it hasn't played out that way. Um, just be curious, what's on the agenda for 2022 for you guys? Yeah, um, you know, kind of as I mentioned with uh, what happened at the beginning of this year with the floodgates opening, it is we are in a, a fortunate position to where I, if you would ask me two years ago, would it still be a contractor's market right now? I'd say absolutely not. But it still is. So we're in a, in a position where, um, you know, we can pick and choose essentially the projects that we want to work on. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's a there's a ton of work in Los Angeles. Um, as you know, the Olympics are coming here. We have the World Cup coming here. So Los Angeles is really exploding and almost almost has a little bubble around it in that sense that there's mm -hmm. a there's a there's too much work and not, a, not enough people to do it. Similar to what right. you're seeing in Miami. Um, but yeah, we have some really cool projects teed up for 2022. Um, you know, we're at a, a smaller project and it's about a $10 million project, but, uh, it's a fun one with David Zwerner. Mm. And if you're in, into art and in the art world, you know, yeah. uh, he's a, a world renowned, uh, gallerist and we're lucky enough to be doing his, uh, LA gallery out here. Oh, so wow. that's, that, that's exciting. And that, that's kind of, again, right, right in line with what we do. We're trying to find these cool, unique projects. Um, it's going to be an absolutely unbelievable space uh, where you're going to see some really, really beautiful art there. So we're excited about that one. That's cool. Um, so larger, you know, we have a $55 million luxury condo unit over in West LA. Again, it's a historic building. Uh, so again, falls in line with what we do. So we're excited to, to see that, that going. Um, and again, it's a lot of stuff that's right in our wheelhouse. We're doing a lot of post-production studios. Um, hospitality, amazingly enough, is still going. Yeah. Uh, you know, they came out, uh, thank God, because, you know, we know a lot of hospitality players that were really hurting through the pandemic. So it's, it's nice to see them surviving and uh, even starting to thrive a little bit coming out of it now that people really want to travel again. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then outside of the, that business side, you know, there's, uh, as you know, in the entrepreneurial world, I have way too many other things that I'm working on that are fun. Um, yeah. So I try, try and stay focused because uh, the construction side is our core business, but we do do real estate development. Uh, we do owner's representation work as well. So we have mm -hmm. two other businesses there that are, uh, again, in the industry. So it's all in our lane. Uh, but those are also moving quickly forward. So we're having fun with those. That's excellent. Uh, you know, Bryson, it's been great talking with you. Uh, we've been speaking with Bryson Rayom. He is the founder and CEO of Rayom Richardson. Um, Bryson, if someone wanted to reach you, where should they find you? Um, obviously, our website, which is uh, rayomrichardson.com. Um, I always tell everyone LinkedIn is a great place to just reach out. Uh, I spend a lot of time on LinkedIn nowadays, uh, uh, you know, uh, mainly from a staffing standpoint. <laughs> but uh, yeah, LinkedIn, our website, uh, Bryson at, at rayomrichardson.com. 
Well, Bryson, thank you so much for being on Uncaged today. We've been speaking with Bryson Rayom. He is the founder and CEO of Rayom Richardson, which is a Los Angeles-based general contractor with over 20 years of experience revitalizing cityscapes throughout California. We've been talking about all of the types of work that they're doing right now, as well as the dynamics in the marketplace. It is a dynamic marketplace, which is probably the core thing to say here. But also, I think, Bryson, that the exciting thing is that not only is your business entrepreneurial and you're innovating there, but you're applying new techniques like EOS to the space and restructuring your own business in a way, yeah. kind of applying kind of your general philosophy and the way you work as well, which is a yeah. wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for being on Uncaged Day. We look forward to having you back. All right. Appreciate it, man. Have a good Cheers. one.